Greetings and welcome back. In the last mini lecture, the point, the major point that I was trying to get across in the last mini lecture is that presidential power uh, begins with how do presidents view their role in, in office. And as a student, uh, you see this all the time with your professors. We all have the same job title, and, and yet we define our roles very, very different. Some of us uh, like myself, see myself as primarily a lecturer. Uh, some see themselves as a lab tech, some as a group facilitator, uh, some as coaches, and certainly that's probably the teaching job I enjoyed the most was when I was a coach uh, for seven or eight years. Uh, and how people define their job obviously has varied dramatically. I talked about literalists versus stewards last time. Remember that literalists are the people presidents who believed that they had enumerated powers only. This was the dominant view of the presidency before the Great Depression, and they tended to be weaker presidents. Uh, more modern presidents have tended to believe in stewardship, this notion that the Constitution grants them vast implied powers. And so rather than being reactive to Congress, they've tended to be much bolder presidents. They've tended to try to lead, in some cases, uh, they uh, they go even beyond that, and certainly uh, I'll talk about this more later on. Today I want to continue uh, with this notion of how powerful uh, is the presidency uh, as an office. Uh, you can read uh, scholars who believe the president is merely a puppet who is being maneuvered by sinister forces behind the scene uh, to people who believe that the president is nearly uh, an elected dictator. I'm going to give you three scholarly perspectives to demonstrate this debate uh, amongst uh, the experts. Uh, the first is uh, Gordon Hoxie, and if you're following along in your notes, uh, Hoxie believed that uh, presidential power is the power to command. Essentially, his claim is take a look at the presidency as an office. Uh, the presidency is the linchpin of the American political system. If you go back to Alexander Hamilton's claim that the two most essential powers uh, of government are the power of the purse and the sword, then the president has both of these. The president is the commander-in-chief of the strongest military machine ever assembled uh, in the history of the world, uh, a person who has thousands of nuclear warheads at his disposal that could destroy every major city uh, in the world multiple times. The president also uh, is the chief budgeter. He is the leading budgetary actor in the country. Uh, he does have the power uh, of the purse with his assistance. Uh, he drafts the executive budget. Uh, and so if governmental power is the power of the person, the power of the sword, then the American president is the predominant actor in both of these, making him the linchpin of the political system. I'm always reminded of an old story of Lyndon Johnson at an Air Force base getting ready to board a helicopter. He started to board a helicopter and a young corporal said, oh no, sir, uh, this helicopter isn't yours. Your helicopter uh, is there at the end. And Johnson smiled at the young corporal and said, son, they're all mine. And, and certainly this demonstrates this notion of, of command and control. And, and certainly uh, that is the perspective of Gordon Hoxie. Uh, the second one uh, I always uh, tend to ask uh, on the exam, and so if this is one that the computer randomizes, uh, look for this one, put some stars next to it, I suppose. Uh, Aaron Woldovsky, who for many years was a very famous professor of political science at the University of California at, Ber at Berkeley, formulated uh, a very famous uh, study, uh, a thesis called the Two Presidencies Thesis. Uh, your book mentions uh, this in the chapter on the presidency. And essentially, Woldovsky made the argument that it, it really isn't fair to say whether the president is strong or whether the president is weak, because it makes an assumption that in all areas, the president is either strong or weak. Woldovsky said that 
that if you take a look at the presidency, there is a very, very strong foreign policy president that presidents tend to get their way two thirds, maybe even three quarters of the time when it comes to foreign policy. That when it comes to foreign policy, there is a very strong uh, bureaucracy, whether it is the Joint Chiefs of Staff, whether it's the CIA, whether it's the National Security Council, these people all respond to him. Woldowski also points out that when there is a foreign policy crisis, when the United States gets involved in a struggle with another country around the world, when there's a crisis or even a potential war situation, the American public tends to engage in what international relations theorists call a rally around the flag phenomenon, patriotic feelings swell, presidential popularity increases significantly, Congress becomes far more reluctant to intervene uh, in foreign policy, especially during a time of crisis. And so the result is presidents tend to get their way the vast majority of the time when it comes to foreign policy issues. On the other hand, Woldowski says if you take a look at domestic policy, the president is a much weaker actor, that a president does a great job uh, if they can get their way a quarter to a third of the time, and usually uh, it's less than that. Uh, and there are several reasons for that. First, Congress gets elected based on bread and butter issues at home, and therefore they are far more willing to battle the president in domestic policy than in foreign policy. In, in domestic policy, for example, if you take a look at economic policy, the Congress does not have to rely on the president for information. When it comes to economic policy, Congress has their own experts, the Congressional Budget Office. So Congress can go toe to toe with the president and say that our experts are giving us very different economic uh, news than your experts are. And so we're gonna reject your assumptions, we're gonna reject your budget, and we're gonna make major modifications to it. And so a second thing that really explains this two Congresses phenomenon is, as I mentioned just a minute ago, when it comes to a foreign policy crisis, the American public rallies around their president. His support level goes up dramatically. But when we have an economic downturn, uh, if we have a recession or, God forbid, a depression, uh, the president's popularity diminishes dramatically. Congress becomes much more adversarial. The president's poll ratings decline dramatically, and, and presidents are, are really stuck. And so, to summarize, Woldowski's thesis, to me, makes a lot of sense. You have a much stronger president in the foreign policy arena, and you have a much weaker president in the domestic policy arena. So two presidencies, one strong and one weak. The third perspective is the perspective that virtually every textbook uses. Uh, it is probably the most popular of these. It's by the eminent political scientist from Harvard, Richard Neustadt. Every year, the American Political Science Association gives an award for the best book in presidential studies, and it's called the Neustadt Award. So certainly uh, this notion uh, is an important one. And so again, put some stars here. You're likely to see this one. Richard Neustadt claims that the presidency as an office is weak, that presidential power when push comes to shove is essentially the power to persuade. And his claim here, his argument is that the presidency as an institution is weak for those reasons I've mentioned earlier. Virtually every power the president has is shared. Uh, in order to get his legislation passed, it has to get through both houses of Congress in identical form, which is very, very difficult. Uh, if he doesn't like legislation, he can veto it. In theory, it can be overridden, although admittedly, that's difficult. Essentially, Newstat argues that the presidency is like one of those crooked carnival games. It's a rigged game. It's destined for mere mortals to fail. However, Neustadt 
claims that if you want to take a look at presidents who are successful, the successful presidents are presidents that are powerful because they understand that presidential power does not come from the Constitution, but that presidential power becomes an extension of their personalities. So the effective presidents, the presidents who get things done, the presidents that are on Mount Rushmore, these people understand that if they have personal skills that they can use, and if they can build powerful coalitions, then they can govern effectively. So if you take a look at Lyndon Johnson, I talked about Johnson earlier. Johnson was not a very effective speaker. Uh, Johnson did not motivate uh, people uh, on a personal level, but Johnson was a very effective tactician. He was incredibly effective in interpersonal communication, and as a result, Johnson was able to get that uh, great society legislation passed. So his skills were organizational. On the other hand, people like John Kennedy, people like Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, these people understood that power came from building a coalition with the American public. And, and so Kennedy and, and Clinton in particular, and I would say Ronald Reagan, I, I don't think anyone has ever read uh, a teleprompter as well as Ronald Reagan. Uh, and these people were able to motivate the American public. They were able to keep their public approval rating strong. Uh, and as a result, uh, Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan were very, very effective uh, at uh, getting significant uh, legislative uh, agendas passed. Uh, so you've got to figure out what your strengths are. Uh, are you an effective communicator? If so, try to form a coalition with the public. Uh, if you're charming, and President Kennedy, I think, did this better than anyone, uh, Kennedy used his humor and goodwill and, and joked and he made very, very powerful allies with the press. He, he charmed the press and as a result, uh, even though President Kennedy engaged in a whole bunch of activities that today would be exposed and would uh, prove to be somewhat scandalous, uh, the press protected Kennedy and these things uh, did not come out during the Kennedy presidency. And, and so Newstat makes uh, probably the best case uh, of any scholar for if you want to understand presidential personality, you need to uh, uh, you need to look at power as an extension of that personality. Now contrast that with Hoxie, because Hoxie is saying that it is the Constitution, it is the roles of the presidency that give the president real power. That uh, being chief budgeter. Uh, and being commander-in-chief really give the president these twin pillars of power that they can constitutionally impose their will. So Hoxie's making the argument that the presidency uh, is very, very strong as an office. Newstat is arguing that the presidency as an office is weak, but that presidents can be very, very powerful if they use their personal skills. And Woldowski takes kind of a an intermediate perspective saying that presidential power is uneven. Uh, it's stronger in one policy area, foreign policy. It is weaker in the other, domestic policy. Now, I want to get specifically next lecture into presidents as people. Uh, I'm going to begin uh, the next lecture with the most famous study of presidential personality, James David Barber's 1972 study called The Presidential Character, uh, which became at one time the most powerful, uh, the most popular. Uh, it was seen as the definitive study of presidential personality. Uh, I don't think it is. I don't think Barber intended it that way, but I do think that Barber gives us uh, an interesting uh, thing to think about in his study. The second one that I'm going to talk about is a study that isn't very well discussed, although it is mentioned in your book, and uh, that is going to be a study by Alexander George looking at presidential advisory systems, looking at how do presidents organize their staffs, how do presidents deal with those people who are closest to him. And we will do that 
in the next lecture.